I don't know if any of you guys ever read uh, Br'er Rabbit, you know, Uncle Remus, uh, or had it read to you when you were kids, but uh, there was that famous moment when, uh, when uh, I think the fox had a hold of, uh, of Br'er Rabbit, and it was a question of whether he should do this or do that to him. And the cho two choices, the one that seemed the most horrible to the, to the uh, fox was to throw him into the briar patch. And uh, so, of course, uh, if I remember the story right, uh, Peter, Co uh, uh, sorry, Peter Cottontail, uh, Br'er Rabbit um, said, please, please don't throw me in the briar patch. It made it sound like that was the worst possible thing. Of course, that was where he lived. So in a, what I'm going to call a uh, don't throw me in the briar patch moment, uh, I'm going to respond to Christian here. Um, and again, uh, Christian, this is a takeoff. Most of what I'm trying to do is that you, you set up something and I can take it and run with it, some of the aspects, some of the ideas in it. But you ask a very specific question. I, and here you are. Um, uh, I just recently read Hale's book on Vermeer. And congratulations, by the way. In this book, Hale states the Japanese prince influenced Vermeer's composition. Actually, he doesn't say that. You might want to look at that again. He says that many people believe that it may have and uh or made statements about it so um but he's then he says i also noticed that some compositions of your students paintings of flowers reminded me of japanese cherry blossoms is this deliberate are you interested in japanese prints and its relationship to impressionist painting if so can you please expand on the subject um frankly i don't see much connection uh christian between impressionist painting and japanese prints uh, uh, in almost any way, you know, but what I'm going to talk about as we go forward here, uh, I think it will clarify for you. Uh, but what I'm saying, uh, don't throw me in the briar patch, what you just did is you just basically asked me to show you my students' work. So for those people who haven't seen it, there'll be some pictures here you've see, who've seen some of this. You've seen some, others you will never have seen before. And I just uh, do this with my students, uh, uh, hopefully with my students' um, going along with it. So, um, so you're seeing here, and by the way, these are all active students. Um, some of them are the generation below me. Uh, and um, uh, others closer to me in time. Uh, but Lynn Melman on the left, and I suspect that might have been one of the ones you saw. She certainly did cherries at one time or another that you can find online. And, um, but then uh, Jean Lightman, in the top, and she was one of my uh, earliest students, and Mary Minifee below her was also fairly early. So it was a three different era, maybe uh, maybe in time in relation to each other, maybe five years difference. But there you are, these things rather you might say feel a little bit of the Oriental, you see Oriental um, uh, objects in each of them. Uh, um, and then uh, we have the works of uh, John Peterson, two on the left. And, uh, and uh, Margie uh, Carrier. And uh, yeah, so in either case, I can see how you might sort of be interested in thinking in terms of something Japanese a little bit, something about these are in that category. Um, but no, it's, uh, it's a little different discussion actually. Um, um, and uh, when you ask that question, let me get back to it, make sure I remember it. So you said, um, um, Hale, the influence of Vermeer's, of, of, Vermeer, of Japanese prints on Vermeer's compositions. So we'll just talk about some points there. Uh, so no, I don't do anything uh, in that way. I never, uh, I mean, I actually recommend students look closely. I've always been a, a, a profound uh, a student of the uh, Japanese print world and, um, and the world around some of the screens and things. So, uh, it shouldn't surprise you. Uh, well, I mean, to say, I mean, so I expect, it wouldn't surprise me if my students had actually picked up some of those things, but none of these things precisely reflect anything about what I'm going to talk about or Vermeer's work in one sense at all. So um, the two things that are mentioned by um, Hale are the Yukio uh, or Yukii E or whatever it's called. Um, um, <laughs> I always forget that word. Uh, prints that, you know, of a generation that 
Hale was looking at. Hale was looking at you tomorrow and those kinds of guys who are not there. Are, there are there are fifty years later or so uh, after Vermeer. But the early guys, um, and I think the one on the far left might be, but I I don't think any of these are. But those are the ones he was looking at and saying there's a certain thing about these that's like that. And I would suggest that if you look at these, he uses the word noten. And he talk, noten is that dark light thing. And the idea of, of distribution of spots, but the, um, the dark spot, light spot, dark spot, light spot, and the in and out of those, uh, that's a crude way of describing it. Um, Bowie's book is a really nice little book on the subject. If you haven't read it, I'm forgetting the guy's first name. But Bowie spent, I think, maybe a lifetime over in Japan and uh, learned how to do Japanese painting. We're talking now about not printmaking, but painting. And he uses, he describes those things. I think so does uh, da Arthur Dow in his book. He describes this idea of noten. It's a very important uh, concept. Um, uh, so the noten thing, though, uh, in their case, this would have been spots, flat spots. And in some sense, you can see Vermeer in that, right? Again, I will assure you that that Hale is not uh, saying that, that, that there's an absolute connection. Now, this is the, I think there was a called the Torin, uh, I think is of the same era. Now, this, this would be actually, I think the upper one at least, I think should be from exactly the same time frame as, um, as Vermeer was alive. And um, so, and there you will see again, uh, basically big light pictures with dark spots on them as the modus operandi, and that's what, and that he refers to, that, that Hale talks about, and he, said, he talks about the unusualness in Dutch painting of actually painting spots of dark as your, as your play rather than spots of light, and you'll see what I mean. So let's go past these for a second. Look at the, uh, look at the Dutch, um, previous Dutch. I probably should stick to my guns here, but you see the ones on the left. These are dark pictures with spots of light. They're a lot like what, you know, basically uh, Sargent did, you know, basically dark pictures with light spots. But you can see the ones on the right. You can see that this is actually, the pictures feel like they're, the spots are the, they're, the key spots are actually dark spots. So that's an interesting thing that is rather like what, what the uh, Japanese are doing. Uh, and uh, so if you look at these, you'll see that these are light pictures and the featuring the darks. And uh, so he wanted to use the word notan uh, to, to, to so rather describe this. Uh, one of the things he talks about, by the way, is the tendency toward diagonals that, uh, that uh, uh, a lot of the, the Japanese have and use. Let's see, does that first, does that one just before this show that? Uh, I think it does. Not this one, but the one above it. You see how these pictures here, they tend to be uh, oriented. See this orientation of this lower one here with, with a line counterline, this sort of thing. And here's this line here and the play back and so on. So these are, these are frankly on diagonals. Even this one is rather reminiscent of some of Campbell's long designs. Uh, you can see that there's a, a long thing that goes this way and it comes back this way and so on. And that's, so there's an interconnection, but this, the overall feeling of this thing is, is um, going out of the picture at the bottom and rather tending to go again out on the right at the top. So that diagonal thing is very characteristic of, the, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Hale. But Hale makes uh, a point of the fact that um, these guys, the other guys are using, I don't know if he uses the word curve, but diagonals and uh, lines, and whereas Vermeer is using verticals and horizontals, and he's, so his blocks are traveling in diagonals, but he's doing them as, as rectangles, rather. So the bottom two being uh, uh, of a different uh, feeling, but I, I refer primarily to the top two. Um, so now, the, the one point reason I really thought this was a cool thing to talk about is because he makes this point here. Uh, he, and he's, he's talking about Hale. Hale's comparing Vermeer with Japanese art here. And he says, both give an impression of design or pattern that is a primary motive and not a sort of byproduct of the storytelling. Now, this is a conversation for the realists around us, for the subject-oriented guys who think the subject is everything. You know, what you're seeing here, when you get to these Vermeers, is you're seeing on the left the traditional use of Western art, which is the story is everything. 
And it's not true about the best of the best, and it's not true of everybody all the time. But what Vermeer does is he goes, well, you may as well just call it that. He goes patternistic. He goes, he goes into the world of visual play for its own sake, which is significantly, uh, you know, why subject is, is so minor. It doesn't mean even matter that things are beautiful with it, without ever going toward that. Again, we can look at the other ones. Uh, and then I'll take you uh, through a couple modern guys, and we'll leave this. We don't, this doesn't have to be a very long one. Uh, so here you are looking at, again, the, the, the beauty of these things. This, this thing is just a beauty. This is just music. This is music. This is what I'm talking about when I tell you pictures ought to be music. And the other ones, these two are closer to being realism, uh, though they have a lot of music to them, And because he never loses that. And then you get to the guys on the left, and they're not about the music. They're about the subject. And I know one of the funny things about the still lifes that the Dutch used to do, they used to apparently put in all kinds of junk that these people owned to show how wealthy they were. So when they would have a still life painted, which they would do by commission, they would just load them up with their stuff, you know, so that the realism thing, here's my object and my, this object and that object. And, and Kolf and some others did some nice, uh, uh, beautiful stuff with it. A lot of them didn't. A lot of it was just the collection of junk, you know. And, uh, but with Vermeer, you know, it's almost never that. And these two on the right really are songs, you know. I think the one on the upper right is the Frick, is that, or is it the uh, Met? Anyways, the, it was one I sort of grew up looking at, so to speak, in my educational years down there. Now what? Now you're looking at these same prints, though, and we're looking at Whistler on the left. And so this is really somebody who actually puts this stuff to use. He's, he's virtually doing, you know, a, a Japanese painting. Now, these guys have been more heavily saturated with this stuff by the time Whistler comes around. And the influence on Degas, which I don't show here, is really quite, quite, quite impressive. But the, but, but the influence on the entire sort of arts and crafts movement, I mean, I think the influence of Vermeer and the... Um, and the, uh, 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 the uh, Japanese of this era, the printmakers, have this rather defining, oh, I don't know if that's even quite the right word. And they don't, I don't, I've not read that they say it anywhere, but you see them talk about it from time to time as on the side, like Dao. But there's something going on there where they're realizing that this is a, uh, this is a two-dimensional music form. And, and whatever you want to call that sort of thing. And, uh, and so this starts happening, and it happens over and over again. I'll just show you Matthews, and we'll clear out. Now, again, the, one in the, the upper one here, I believe, actually belongs to the earlier period. But it's easy to miss that the, the deriva, you know, that this is fully derived, as it were, from that, right? And by the way, you could argue even just the idea of the diagonal sort of sweeping up the overall movement up out of this picture and the counter, counterplay. Uh, this is, but this is in these dark spots. There's your no tan idea, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I just thought you might like to know that. This is Arthur Matthews. I didn't, I should really have put the names down here for your edification, but it takes so much time to do this in the first place. Sometimes I can't, I can't be bothered. And sometimes I actually get the guy wrong anyway. Uh, so, all right, I, um, going all, I'm gonna go all the way back to your uh, question again, make sure I haven't missed anything. And um, have a look at it. So I recently read Hale's book on Vermeer. In this book, Hale states that Japanese prints influence Vermeer's composition. You know what I think of that. Uh, read again. Read type more closely. I also noticed that some compositions of your students' paintings of flowers remind me of Japanese cherry blossoms. Is that deliberate? And in my case, it's not. In fact, one of those things that I used to abhor when I was a student, you know, was painting Japanese objects because they were so beautiful that. You know, the temptation is if you're thinking, to think if you painted a pretty object, you had a pretty picture. And I just somehow knew better than that. And a lot of people today, as again, I'd say that's the, the realism mindset right now, is if you get a beautiful enough girl in a beautiful enough setting, and how can it be bad, right? I remember painting a, a, a landscape with Gemmell, and, and he said, well, it looks like a postcard. And he didn't do it with anything except sarcasm. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, is, but what, why was he saying that, right? What do you bring to it if you just simply have a beautiful woman, you know? What are you bringing to this thing as a rectangle? So this is your chance to actually keep looking closer at, um, at um, the Japanese and Vermeer and don't take your eyes off them. But look at the greater world because the idea, what art is, as I've said before, art, art, is, art is, 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 is bigger than all of us and it's, and it's one. 
I could repeat that over and over and I wouldn't be saying it enough. All right. So thank you, Christian, very much for that. And thank you all. Um, I wonder, oh, I didn't mention, uh, I should have done right at the front here to thank uh, Richard Gidd for that really nice, substantial uh, donation. That was really, really appreciated, Richard. Uh, uh, and um, I think I will, uh, yeah, I think I've done my duty. Uh, do subscribe, share, uh, comment, and all that sort of stuff. I definitely could use some more questions. And, uh, and, uh, and yeah, so there you are. Thank you very much.